Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Alex Kulfergus, uh, Global Covenant of Mayors Canada Project Officer. So um, before we do, I have a quick outline, sorry, here we go, of the agenda um, for the call. So by my colleague, Megan Meany from ICLE Canada. Um, we will follow up with more questions because um, I'm sure you'll have lots. And finally, uh, we'll end with a conclusion. Um, before we, we get started, I just want to say that uh, the Global Covenant of Mayors in Canada is a collaboration between FCM, ICLE Canada, the Global Covenant of Mayors Secretariat, and the International Urban Cooperation Project. Um, the, the project as a whole is supported by funding from the European Union. Um, as well, before I get the question, um, the webinar is going to be recorded and sent out to all participants within a couple of hours. So you should be able to uh, review this great webinar and also share it with your colleagues uh, who weren't able to make it today. All right, so we'll jump into it. Uh, Abbas, who is over to you. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here with you today and indeed connecting from Brussels and from the GCOM Global Secretariat here. And uh, myself, uh, I'm in particular in charge of liaising with all the regional and national covenants, uh, such as the one for Canada, but also worldwide, as we will see in the, um, in the presentation. So today, to start this webinar, the idea was to give you an overview of what this global alliance is about, and uh, so that we have also a little bit of a, a wider framework of um, how the, the GCOM in Canada fits into this uh, global movement. So first of all, the first couple of last slides are laying out our main principles and uh, why is it that the, that the GCOM, as we call it, um, uh, um, we also uh, know from recent uh, studies that more than 70% of the global CO2 emissions actually um, are generated by uh, cities and local governments uh, around the world. And uh, currently, cities consume more than 66% of the world's energy. And when we refer to city, we refer to any kind of local government, uh, no matter what the size, the location, or, or the geographical um, specificities uh, apply in this case. So. This is our first thing. There's no solution without cities. Cities need to be at the heart of the climate change policies. And this is what the, the Global Covenant of Mayors intends to strengthen and support. If you move to the next. Action has been happening at the point right now where we can see emergency declarations right through, uh, through the latest cycle of climate diplomacy have been uh, finally recognized as key actors of uh, the climate change policy, diplomacy and action. And we can definitely see um, after the, the, the Paris Agreement that we have now uh, a political momentum to actually not only give more visibility to what local governments are doing um, on the climate action, but also the impact that they're having and that they could still continue to have and how they could still support the, the efforts done at the national level to actually reach uh, the, the goals established within um, international agreements. If we move to the next, uh, you can actually now, we are now uh, counting on more than 10,000 signatories, as we call them, so cities and local governments of all sizes joining the Global Covenant of Mayors around the world. They are now spread across 139 countries, um, representing more than 900 million people around the world, and that is a little bit over 12% of the global population. And I would say that these numbers keep increasing on a daily basis. And to actually articulate this alliance, we um, have actually uh, uh, a wide network of global partners uh, that were at the origin of this movement and that are now complemented by a series of uh, groups of very active uh, regional and, and national partners, including city networks, private uh, sector par partners, research institutions, and any other kind of uh, organization aiming at supporting local governments in their efforts. 
um, as yucks that mobilizing the, the collective agenda couldn't be delivered without the, the support and, and direct um, engagement of all the city networks, either at the very national, regional, certain regional, any kind of uh, networks that uh, have been up and running for a pretty long time and have been supporting local governments with their climate action agenda for quite some time and that are now supporting and embedding that action within the GCOM mandate. So, as a result of this mobilization, we now have 13 regional or national governance of mayors established worldwide, and you can see on this map uh, where they are currently located and the fact that they're covering most of the world at this point. Why do we have regional and national? Because in some contexts and in some specific region, um, the, the ongoing initiatives and programs that were already providing support to local governments on the ground uh, already called for a very country-specific uh, approach, and therefore it made sense to develop specific national governments, such as the one in Canada. And even though in the ones that are, have more of a regional scope, such as, for example, in Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa, the country approach is being strengthened um, more and more to be able to account for, for key uh, national stakeholders. And to support this network, we currently have 14 help desks, uh, and there is indeed one for Canada, providing targeted support to signatory cities around the world. And so just support governments, uh, being, uh, key actors in Canada who have been supporting either technically or financially, or with like very specific uh, technological support, uh, Canadian Local Climate Action, and this is a network that is getting bigger um, as the initiative rolls out. Here you, only ha you have a like, series of, of very um, brief, uh, like a key numbers that are actually the result of a need assessment that was carried out at the um, global level by the GCOM Secretariat to, to understand not only the opportunities, challenges, but also needs that cities had or even expectations um, for the for the GCOM to actually roll out in their own specific region and country. And some of the key findings that we had among Canadian cities that were part of this um, of this assessment, of this consultation, was that um, for 20%, 21% of the Canadian cities that were uh, access to city level data was considered uh, as a key enabler um, and, and, and could actually be so either an enabler or a key challenge for cities to be able to move forward with local climate action. 29% um, of the Canadian cities that were interviewed um, considered that the strong local and regional political support was definitely an, enable, an enabler and uh, a key asset to be able to move forward with their ambitious agendas. And obviously, uh, that is paired also with the uh, uh, importance of the supportive national government uh, for such policies to be implemented. And initiatives that the uh, summary uh, for cities and local governments to be able to move forward with their commitments. So they are called Innovate for Cities, Invest for Cities, and Data for Cities. Uh, Innovate for Cities focuses on research and innovation tailored to the needs of cities and local governments to be able to accelerate transformation, innovation, and develop partnerships that uh, will allow to address critical gaps in the areas of data, research, and technology. And in that framework, we are developing partnerships with all types of institutions, both in the academic world, but also um, in the private sector with kind of a, a, visionary, a visionary businesses uh, that are um, keen to develop technological solutions aiming at solve some of the main challenges that cities have at the moment to be able to move forward with their commitments. Invest for Cities tackles the, the very, like the number one uh, priority that many of the local governments around the world 
uh, flag as as uh, one of their challenges, which is um, the access to climate finance at the local level. And therefore, as part of this initiative, we are not only uh, aiming at unlocking project pipelines around the world, but also uh, through a series of partnerships, mobilizing innovative um, finance solutions and mechanisms that uh, can make funding and financing more accessible to local governments um, to be able to implement their climate action plans. And finally, for data for cities, this is more of our, I would say, technical initiative that has been focusing not only in uh, creating a series of requirements that signatories have are committing to um, report on, but also uh, to actually try to harmonize the the, the methodologies and uh, and the approaches to, to climate action so they can be uh, compared uh, from one region to each other so that data can be better aggregated and so the the impact that the the impact of the actions that the signatories carried out or the commitments that they pledged to uh, can actually be more uh, easily uh, calculated, visible, and used for uh, all advocacy and, and visibility purposes. And that's all on my side. In this last slide, I think you have just, um, if you want to know more about the Global Covenant of Mayors, you have the global website that is listed here, and uh, as well as the social media that we use in order to be able to make um, local climate action at the global level more visible and so we encourage you to join this global movement and uh, and benefit from all the support and uh, and the community not only at the Canadian level but also worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you Elise and also thank you for joining us uh, at least I know six hours later than we are here uh, in Ottawa so I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to take it uh, from here to just discuss a little bit more about the, the GCOM in Canada. Um, but like I said, there are two question periods. So if you have questions at any time, please don't hesitate to just write them in the question box, um, before you forget them and we will get to them very soon. So in Canada, um, there are 50 Canadian signatories from across the country. Uh, this is a number that has increased pretty significantly, um, over the past year. Um, and so. I guess to back up just a little bit, the Global Covenant of Mayors uh, globally has existed for many years, um, but the uh, Global Covenant of Mayors Canada is a relatively new endeavor. So we started last year uh, with the GCOM Help Desk, which is, uh, as I said, led by ICWI Canada, um, FCM, IUC Project, and the GCOM Secretariat. Um, and so that's really helped quite a few Canadian municipalities that were interested in joining GCOM um, or that had already committed to GCOM, but it's kind of helping them uh, have a, um, a more national approach towards GCOM and, and how, we, uh, how we approach climate action here. So those 50 signatories represent 37% of the Canadian population, which is not too bad. Here we go. So why are municipalities joining GCOM? Um, there's a couple of different reasons. Uh, Elise highlighted some of the, you know, requests and the needs that municipalities have. Um, but more specifically, when municipalities join GCOM, um, what we hear from them is often that they're looking for support to increase the ambition of their climate action uh, locally. So whether that be a support through a network or support through the increased visibility, which is the second uh, top element that cities mentioned to us, um, the GCOM help desk really is here to, to, to support you and to help you move through the GCOM um, objectives, but more globally to help you uh, just have, do better climate action in your municipality. Um, as well, municipalities are often looking to belong to a global movement. So GCOM is, with its over 10,000 members, um, the largest global movement of, of, of local government working towards uh, a safer and more just world. So, you know, joining that network uh, is meaningful for, for many, many cities, and it's meaningful as a, as a large group of all of us. And as well, um, you know, any signatory has access to the GCOM help desk and the GCOM network, both nationally and internationally as well. So these are some of the main benefits. Of course, every city has different ones, but uh, these are this is what we've been hearing. 
So the, the structure of GCOM in Canada, it's, it's a bit complicated. Um, I tried to kind of map it out here. But um, so essentially, where Elise works, and that's the global secretariat. Um, and we are really the, the help desk in Canada. So she was mentioning the 14 different help desks around the world, but we have one specifically for Canada, um, just because we have a different reality than the US and Mexico than the rest of North America. So that group, the group of, of organizations uh, whose logos you see on the screen, we're really the, the drivers of GCOM in Canada. Um, so we share different responsibilities and, uh, and roles. Finally, um, there's the two bottom lines. So one of them is the GCOM help desk, which I've been just you know, mentioning. The other one I'm not going to go into too much today, but I wanted to show it here because we often receive questions about this program. Um, so the Showcase Cities program is a pilot that we have been piloting for, well, since September of 2019. And it's going to finalize in September 2020. Um, so within that project, we've selected 25 Canadian municipalities who have been um, piloting a more intensive approach to GCOM. And so we've been working very, very closely with them over the past couple of months to help them achieve their GCOM objectives. So it's not totally done yet. We will have more information to share with all of you about um, you know, what the results were of that project, but it's been quite promising so far. Um, and of course, there's a possibility that we would integrate some of our learnings from that Showcase Cities pilot into the general uh, GCOM help desk. So in Canada, um, because there were already existing programs, as I know many of you are, as I'm looking through the names, like I see that many of you are PCP members, uh, many of you have joined the, the BARC program. So we didn't want to reinvent the wheel there. Um, so the Global Covenant of Mayors really focuses on mitigation and adaptation. Um, so it's a joint initiative, but we didn't want to replicate the work that had already been done over the past 25 years, for example, with the PCP program over the past 10 years of the BARC program. So what we've done is that we've kind of integrated those two programs um, in many ways. So if you join GCOM um, as a GCOM signatory in Canada, you can have access to all the PCP um, tools, resources and guides, uh, the PCP hub and the PCP network on the mitigation side. So those are really to support you as you work through your milestones, um, sorry, as you work through your badge levels uh, for GCOM. And on the adaptation side, it's very similar. So um, you know, any Canadian municipality that becomes a signatory to GCOM can um, achieve your, your badges by working through the BARC framework, um, using the BARC reporting tool eventually to, to report your data um, and using the resources and guides that are available to you through that program. So, Again, we're, we're just kind of trying to um, bring more of an international approach and an international network, but not reinvent all the work that you've all been doing for so long. So what is the process for achieving GCOM badges? Um, it's not very complicated. I'll walk you through it uh, very briefly. Uh, so the first step is to commit to GCOM. Um, so what does that mean? It means that council must formally approve and sign a letter of commitment So we have a letter of commitment that is available to all Canadian municipalities. Um, you can find it online or you can write to me. Uh, and that letter must be signed by council for you to officially become a GCOM signatory. And once you're officially a GCOM signatory, um, we'll, we'll set aside some time, whether that be by email or by phone, to, to discuss with you and to set your objectives for the reporting cycle. Now, generally a reporting cycle is about a year. Um, usually it, goes, it runs from, from July to July. Of course, this year with COVID, everything's kind of all up in the air. So it's, it's been extended a little bit more, um, but usually you can assume it's pretty much a year. So we'll help you determine which badges you hope to achieve by the end of the re reporting cycle um, and what your needs are, whether you want us to put you in touch with anyone or if you need certain resources, the help desk is there for that. And then the hard part starts. <laughs> so that's the part where you complete your objectives. Um, so you can complete the actions that are outlined in the common reporting framework, which is really the methodology that GCOM uses um, for the reporting and for the, the allocation of badges or awarding badges. So again, the reporting framework can be found online um, and I'm happy to share it with anyone who's interested in looking at it. Um, in many, many cases, 
I won't get into it too much, but in many cases, um, you might find that your municipality has already completed many of the steps that are necessary to achieve certain badges. So it may not be actually that difficult to achieve, um, you know, just the little bits and the little gaps that you might be missing to really fully achieve the, the, the GCOM badges. Then we ask you to report. So um, we'll collect all your data um, and your final results, and we'll send that to the GCOM Secretariat so that they can aggregate that information um, and share it worldwide. So whether that be with the, for example, the, the UNFCCC when, uh, during the climate negotiations, or whether that's us reporting to our federal government saying, look, look at all this great work the municipalities are doing. Um, help them, <laughs> help them achieve their climate goals. So that's the kind of stuff we do with your, with your data. And then finally, uh, we encourage everyone to communicate. So communicate your final results locally and nationally. Um, and we can do the international part too. Um, so, you know, our goal is really to, to showcase the municipalities that are our GCOM members and that are working really, really hard to, to you know, on their adaptation and on their mitigation initiatives. Um, so communication is a big, big piece there. And then finally, um, you know, once that whole process has gone, you, once you've gone through that whole process, we encourage you to increase your ambition and to restart. So the GCOM cycle is very much cyclical, so it kind of never ends. Um, but uh, we can help you um, work on what that means, you know, how to, how to increase ambition and how to work with council or how to work with staff. To, to become more ambitious and, and to go towards a, a cleaner world. So I'll stop here for questions. I do wanna say that we are going to be getting into the reporting section right after this. So if you have questions about reporting, you can feel free to ask them, but uh, just know that you will, uh, you will hear more about that. And I'm not seeing any questions right now, which is, either a good or a bad thing. But what we might do is just continue and then um, we'll stop for questions after the reporting. Hello everyone, my name is Megan Meany. I'm the Executive Director of ICLEI Canada. We've been working with FCM on the GCOM in Canada uh, through the Showcase Cities project and the GCOM Canada Help Desk. So there's four things I'm going to cover for you today. First, I'm going to speak to how GCOM aligns with Canada's existing uh, programming for municipalities on climate change. Then I'm going to speak to the common reporting framework. Um, I'll talk about the timelines for reporting within the GCOM. And I'll talk about the platforms that you can use for your reporting. So moving in to how the GCOM aligns with Canadian programming. So I know there's a lot visually on this slide. At the top, you'll see the commitment badge. This is what you receive when you formally join GCOM and make a commitment to take action on climate mitigation and adaptation. Then you can see on the left, we've got the mitigation and adaptation uh, images and these bars that go across um, to the right. So on the mitigation side, the first step is to do an inventory. The second step is to set a greenhouse gas emission reductions target. And the third is to develop a plan of action. On the adaptation side, the first step in GCOM is doing your climate risk and vulnerability assessment. Then it's to set your climate adaptation goals. And then it's to develop your plan of action. Um, to improve your resilience and adaptive capacity. So how this aligns with uh, Canada's existing programming, we've got the Partners for Climate Protection Program, which uh, works on climate mitigation, and the Building Adaptive and Resilient Communities Program, or BARC, that works on adaptation. So first I'll talk about mitigation. You can see these circles above inventory, target, and plan. The first circle shows is purple and it shows a graph. That's PCP milestone one. So the first step on the mitigation side of GCOM essentially aligns with PCP milestone one. The second step aligns with PCP milestone two. 
And then the third step aligns with PCP milestone three. On the BARC side, uh, milestone two of BARC, your, re your research milestone, aligns with the assessment section of GCOM. And then both goal and plan for GCOM aligns with milestone three of the BARC program. So that gives you a sense of how it aligns with our existing programming. You'll also want to think about the common reporting framework. Um, so the common reporting framework is, uh, is a framework that allows for a level of standardization across the 10,000 GCOM cities. Now there's, there's certainly a lot of flexibility in how municipalities plan for climate change. Municipalities are expert planners. It's a lot of what you do in municipal government. And so you're expected to bring your own approach to these things. But there is this common reporting framework that lends a level of standardization. And this really speaks to transparency in the programming. It speaks to streamlining measurement across municipalities and streamlining the reporting process. So there's, there's five um, sections within the common reporting framework. The first section deals with how the GHG emissions inventory um, is developed, the methodology used. Uh, the second step is the, how the risk and vulnerability assessment is done. The third is your target and goal setting process. The fourth is climate action and energy access planning. I'll say that the energy access planning component of GCOM is still under development. Uh, so there's some pending information coming on that. And then there's the monitoring and reporting steps. I highly recommend uh, you take a look at the common reporting framework so you can get a really good understanding of what kind of reporting is involved in getting uh, involved in GCOM. Now, there's a, there's a specific um, recommendation for the timeline in which municipalities report into GCOM. Within the first two years, it's expected that your, your GHG inventory is reported, your assessment of risks and vulnerability is reported, and your targets are reported, your targets for emissions and your goals for resilience. Within three years of joining, you're expected to have your climate mitigation and adaptation plan completed. That might be in one plan or it might be in two separate plans. Um, as I said, the energy access planning process is um, the terms and guidelines for that are still being developed. So there's no expectation of reporting on that side yet. And then um, the GCOM recommends that you report every four years after submitting your climate action action plan uh, progress and that would include updating your GHG emissions inventory. And then finally I wanted to speak about the reporting platforms you have at your disposal when you join GCOM. These are specific to Canada here uh, and there's three things at your disposal. The first two, the PCP tool and the BARC tool, are their capacity building tools and the reporting platform. So you can do your inventory and plan and target in the PCP tool. You can do your vulnerability and risk assessment and adaptation plan in the BARC tool. And then you can also use them for your reporting into GCOM. There's also the unified reporting platform, which is at your disposal. And this, it's not so much a capacity building tool, but a reporting platform for GCOM uh, that many cities in Canada are using as well. So with that, I'm going to move into the question period. You're welcome to use the chat box um, to enter your questions and Alex, Elise and I will um, be here to address them. Thank you very much. So we have, again, this is all kind of written out in a better way than just hearing it from me now. But those sectors are required in a GCOM compliant inventory. Um, and it very well may be that you don't have emissions from agriculture or from aviation or from waterborne navigation. But it, you're still required to 
make that statement in your inventory. So if you don't have emissions from there, you, you make a statement within your reporting that you contemplated it, it wasn't applicable, um, and then you can use this thing called notation keys to recognize that you aren't indeed reporting. And this, this kind of issue falls under that common reporting framework, right? We, we we're aiming for a certain level of standardization in which all cities report their information. I'll touch on one other thing, um, where because you were talking about how does it align with PCP reporting. The other um, fairly significant deviation is around the ambition level of your target. So in the PCP, they don't prescribe, or we don't prescribe how ambitious your, tar ambitious your target has to be. In the GCOM, it is required that your target is as ambitious as your nationally determined contribution or what's known as the NDC. That's the federal government's target. So that is in Canada right now, is it 50% below 2005 levels? It's about, about that. So they want you to have an, a target that's at least as aspirational as that target. Now, sometimes we'll, we'll have to get into some um, kind of verification of that because you won't necessarily have the exact same baseline year um, as, as the federal government does. You might have set one a long time ago or maybe you're starting your inventory process now and there's no way you can go that far back in time and get a realistic uh, or, or get a, an inventory in which you're, you're confident in the data. So we might have to do sort of some extrapolation to make sure that that aligns with the NDC or is at least as ambitious as the NDC, um, but that can still be done. Great, thanks, Megan. Um, and like Megan was saying, um, we do have tables that really step by step and show what the differences are between PCP or BARC and GCOM and, and how to do move from one program to the other. So happy to share that with uh, with anyone. Um, I have another question here about what are the Covenant of Mayor's thoughts on the most strategic development, infrastructure development projects for Canadian municipalities. I'm not gonna get into that during this webinar, A, because I don't have an answer that would fit any, like any and all municipalities. Um, but I guess I just wanted to mention that GCOM is really, um, more of like a, a reporting uh, program. So we're, we're helping you like gather your data, um, you know, analyze it properly and then report on it. We're not so much of a, an infrastructure program as such. So we wouldn't be providing you with those kinds of uh, suggestions or tips. We're really working on more of the process. So. And I think some of that is very dependent on um, the makeup of your community and your emissions profiles. You know, if your if your community is generally powered by electricity with kind of zero emissions, you're going to have a much different profile than a community that relies a lot on diesel or propane or something like that. So that first stage in your in your mitigation kind of pathway or badge work is really going to help inform what are the best steps for your community to take to help uh, reduce those emissions. Well said. <laughs> Completely agree. Um, so here's another question. Um, if a city is getting A's for GHG and physical risk reporting through CDP, are we fully covering GCOM requirements for reporting? So this is referring to the city's baseline uh, survey. Honestly, we'd have to check with, um, we'd have to like compare the, the, the framework for that uh, survey. And the GCOM. Yeah, I know CDP does multiple kind of reporting. They have their kind of grading system that they put yeah. out, which it's similar to the GCOM reporting, but it, I don't think it's the exact same. Um, so I think, yeah, we'd have to have a closer look. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But for those of you who are already reporting through CDP, um, you know, if you're not already GCOM signatories, and I'm assuming most of you aren't <laughs> seeing as you're on this webinar, um, you know, it is possible to just check the you know once once you have officially committed to gcom of course it's possible to check the the gcom survey box um which will just kind of open up tons more questions or not tons but many more questions um for you to go through so if you're interested in looking at that before um becoming a, a gcom signatory i know that there are some uh, template 
uh, surveys that you can go look at on the CDP website. Um, but like Megan was saying, it's not so much of a capacity building tool. So you won't be able to develop your plan, for example, in the CDP tool, you're only able to report through it. So that's assuming that you already have a tool that you're using um, to guide you in the development of your plan or to guide you in whatever the development of your, your inventories or your, or sorry, not your inventory, your assessment. Um, but you can definitely go and look on their website to see what the survey looks like um, for GCOM compliance cities. Uh, so here's a question about the timeline. So uh, this is from Amy, who's saying that I had previously read the municipalities had to report updated inventories and in progress every two years. But I see in that slide uh, about the timeline that it is four. Has that changed recently or am I misunderstanding? So no, you, uh, you're absolutely right. This has changed recently. So we didn't really get into this so much uh, during this webinar, but over the past year, as GCOM Canada has um, you know, developed, we have been consulting with our members um, and, and based off of uh, some of the requirements as well that you can find in the PCP and the BARC programs, um, we've gone back to the GCOM secretary with a couple of recommendations uh, for changes that would suit Canadian municipalities better than what is in the common reporting framework. Um, the common reporting framework is great and it's a really good basis, but it's, it's meant to be kind of universally applicable. Um, and in a couple of different areas, it didn't fit the Canadian context, either because municipalities don't have control over um, certain pieces of legislation, you know, or certain areas of GHG emissions. Um, or maybe because it just didn't work out with the timeline and the, the, the amount of time it takes, for example, to make an inventory. So we went back to them um, and we received uh, approval, although it is not officially and publicly available yet, but to modify the common reporting framework to better suit the Canadian needs. So very soon we're, we're going to be coming out with the Canadian common reporting framework. There are a couple of changes and they're especially on the mitigation side, um, but that the, the most major change is the one that you point out, Amy, which is about the um, the four year time period to rep uh, to report updated inventories in progress, rather than two years. And we've and what we've heard is that that is a much better fit for Canadian municipalities. Um. So another question here is: Our baseline is twenty fifteen because we couldn't access two thousand and five data. If it turns out that it isn't as ambitious as the NDC, what happens? Do we forfeit our GCOM membership? Maybe Megan, I'll let you uh, tackle that one. <laughs> yeah, I think I, part of the reason for having the Showcase Cities um, kind of pilot project first before going full steam with GCOM in Canada was to test some of these questions, quite honestly, because we know this is going to be the case in many cities. It's so difficult to have everybody aligned on the same baseline here. Um, so we're in the showcase group, we're helping a few cities now conduct some kind of forecast backcast exercises to demonstrate what their uh, targets would look like aligned with um, the NDC. We're at the in the next couple of months, we're getting to the compliance kind of process where we go back and forth with GCOM around what's acceptable and what's not. So I don't have a crystal clear answer on that, but my intuition is that um, we're going to be able to work with it, that um, it's just an impossibility to have every city completely aligning uh, with that NDC. And as long as it's a justifiable level of ambition um, and you know, somewhat uh, aligned and justified that we'll be able to uh, proceed with it. Yeah, and again, we're here to help, right? So we're here to help as much as possible. So we're not going to be, anyway, if you have those kinds of questions, we're, we're happy to address those and to work with you on developing targets that work in, you know, in case that one doesn't. Um, here's another question um, from Patricia, who's asking, who's saying that, they're a community that has GHG reduction goals, but no climate adaptation or mitigation plan. Um, on the one hand, I feel signing on would help us to get there, but on the other hand, it feels daunting. Do you suggest that communities do some climate action first prior to signing on, or could this be a good place to start? I can, uh, I can take yeah, this one. I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. You well, go I first. Gonna say, okay. I was going to say that this, uh -huh. um, you know, this program is, 
definitely a program that is ambitious and does encourage you to, to, to have ambitious climate action, but it's also meeting you where you're at. So um, something that we also didn't mention is that um, the badge levels or the steps that you need to get to a certain badge, they don't have to be done chronologically. So if you already have a goal, but you don't have an inventory, um, that's fine. And you know, we'll meet you there and we'll, we'll help you work on um, the inventory piece or whatever pieces that you're missing. Um, you know, and, and as well, GCOM is, is um, different than some other city programs where GCOM is, does not aim to only work with the larger cities um, that have more resources, that have more staff and more experience um, on climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. We are very much um, interested in helping and working with smaller municipalities or municipalities that don't have as much capacity. So I would say you can do some climate action work first, um, but this can also be the place where you start. And in many cases, um, for, men, for some of the, the 50 Canadian signatories, that is exactly where they have started. You know, they, they were pushed by citizens and they were pushed by council to uh, formally take action on climate change. And this is their response um, by joining GCOM and then by working through the GCOM framework, um, which kind of helps shape your climate action in a way that has been recognized worldwide. Um, so they've, they've found a lot of value in that. I'll let Megan uh, complete. Yeah, I was just going to add that I find with many municipalities, this kind of climate work is very iterative. They often start with the mitigation side and that there's kind of a longer history of action on that side. Um, and then they, they grow into the adaptation planning process. And one of the reasons why that can be a helpful way to do it is because it generally shouldn't be just one person alone at their desk in their municipality taking this on, right? Usually you're engaging with the broader community, developing groups, like stakeholder group committees, that sort of thing that can help um, support this process. So if you just start with one of the tabs or the badges, you can really anticipate that it you know, building your building your steering committees and building your groups will help bring the support you need to tackle the other aspects. Um, if I can just add to that, Alex and, yeah, and uh, Megan, I perfectly agree with you. And I think this is a situation that we see in other regions and in other countries too, because obviously the experience that each one of the local governments has acquired or, or, or the priorities that they have had in the past have also um, kind of marked where they are like right now. In some regions, for example, they, they were only focusing on adaptation and not doing at all any work on, on mitigation. So the, the exact opposite situation, and this is for example, mainly happening in Africa and Southeast Asia, where the, the, the priorities were more on adaptation. And uh, as Alex was saying, I think the, the, the goal of the, of the GCOM Alliance is really to raise the ambitious, whatever the, the the baseline was for each one of the municipalities joining, knowing obviously that the context and the challenges that each one of the municipalities faces are very different within one country, depending on the context, the resources, etc. but even more from one region uh, to another. And so uh, the idea is to really um, support you throughout your GCOM journey uh, through these different areas of support that we have. If it means working only on uh, on mitigation as a start and, and moving forward with that one or just like moving one step forward with adaptation to actually have the opportunity of bringing that subject to the table of your municipality, uh, then obviously it's it's already a, a huge achievement uh, for many and even more for many of the smaller uh, municipalities that have joined GCOM. So I think it is indeed a, a very good opportunity to, to actually say, okay, we have to give some framework to how, uh, to the response that we want to give to this, um, to this responsibility that we have, and we're gonna use the GCOM framework to actually do so. But uh, we set our targets and we set uh, our aims and our level of ambition based on where we're starting from, whatever that level is, uh, is I think the, the main message here is to actually uh, get the municipality started and provide them the support that they need, even if it is to, to move just from one step forward uh, from which they started. Thank you, Elise. Um, there's a question here asking whether if anyone has compared GCOM reporting 
to the TCFD disclosure by cities, which is the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, which is, I believe, conducted by the Chartered Accountants of Canada. I think that TCD, that TC, da, 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 um, it has a comparison to the PCP and BARC requirements in it, uh, but it doesn't do the GCOM one. So it gets part way there. Um, and another question is uh, related to COVID. So given the importance of coping with COVID, uh, does the Canadian Help Desk have any guidance on how municipalities can optimally address COVID while also taking climate action? Uh, that's a great question that obviously everyone here has been asking themselves. How do we continue working on climate action while also coping with COVID and the, the repercussions there? Um, I can't say that we have a final response for you, David. Um, but what I can say is that uh, through the, the GCOM network, we've been promoting um, resources that have emerged. So from around the world, a uh, couple of different depending on you know, the, the topic or the focus. Um, these resources have been used by different municipalities in Canada um, and also in other parts of the world. Um, but we haven't, you know, we don't have like one specific approach again for, for all municipalities. Um, we've, we've also been sharing information about how to continue the, the, the climate planning process during this time. So um, for example, many of our showcase cities during their calls have been sharing um, just different ways that they've been continuing their work while uh, being affected by, you know, the, the social distancing and not being allowed to run public consultations, for example. And so how to move those online or how to move those um, in a different way. So it's kind of a yes and no <laughs> answer. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things we've been thinking a lot about at ICLE and the context of BARC is there's there's 80 some municipalities that have used the BARC framework to develop, to develop their um, adaptation plans. And we know that there's, there's a certain percentage of them now looking back at those plans to see, did they process and how can we kind of better in our plans? So we're kind of thinking about that, that now and we'll be um, incorporating kind of some of these lessons learned from having gone through the COVID pandemic um, into the, this is the capacity building materials of BARC. And just to add on my side, uh, at the global level, we're also working on a series of resources that we will be uh, making available. So not, not Canadian specific, but uh, globally available on green recovery and the, and the role and, and strategies of uh, local governments to actually um, like shape their plans or rethink their plans uh, with uh, the green recovery lenses. This is definitely, obviously, a, a very important topic, um, but uh, it will take time, I think, for us to, to fully, yeah, come up with some made in Canada uh, options for you. But um, we're definitely happy to help put people in touch with, with those who have already done some of that work. So I'm not seeing any more questions here. I would say this is your last chance if, if you have a, a burning question that you haven't asked yet. But um, otherwise, we will end this webinar er early. I'm just letting, giving people an opportunity, but I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, so I'd like to just thank you all so much for, for taking the time to learn more about the Global Covenant through some of your questions. Um, but of course, we didn't get into everything. So if you do have um, other questions or further comments, or you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me um, or with anyone else who was on the call, you can write to me at uh, globalcovenant at fcm.ca and I will be in touch with you very shortly. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on the call, the meeting recording is gonna be shared uh, very shortly with everyone. So you should receive that automatically by email um, within the next couple of hours. If you don't, uh, again, write to me and let me know and I'll, I'll just send it your way. So thank you again and uh, I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much.